Well, thanks everybody for joining us today for this last of our webinars before Christmas. I'm sure you're all ready for a break. But uh, today we have a presentation by Murray Hall, who's the founder and owner of a company called Hall Tech out of Canada. Uh, Murray's uh, background started uh, more than 40 years ago when he was trained up in fisheries and wildlife management. And uh, he then worked for several years in, in uh, that industry, learning uh, expertise in ecological monitoring and that side of things. Um, he has uh, since uh, established Hall Tech, which is really specialising in uh, developing technologies for monitoring, uh, particularly uh, aquatic ecosystem type monitoring. So today, Mo's going to present on some of their technologies, specifically electro fishing and uh, also uh, on eDNA, which is being used to characterize species that are present in these ecosystems. Um, so today, just a few uh, administrative things before we get started. If you want to raise a question, the Q&A button is at the top of your screen. You click on that and please do uh, raise questions. It's, it's a privilege to have someone of Murray's expertise and uh, he is uh, staying up late in Canada to share with us his knowledge. Um, Next slide, please, Michelle. So HydroTerra is running these webinars really to generate awareness for yourselves in the industry. Uh, we see this as part of our role in training industry and the various technologies that are out there. Uh, but a big part of this is also to get a feel for industry needs. And, and this one's an exciting area for HydroTerra as we are moving more and more into assisting natural resource managers uh, with their monitoring of the environment. So looking forward to some questions there. Um, next slide, thanks. So I've dealt with part one of the webinar program. Uh, part two will be a presentation by Murray from Hall Tech. And then part three, we will run through a Q&A session. Uh, Murray has worked all over the world. Um, his business is located in Canada, but uh, they've done work in Africa and uh, a lot in the US and South America, for example. Um, so they are a leading, uh, a leading company specialising in aquatic research. It is quite a niche industry and we're certainly hoping that Murray's bringing some new knowledge into Australia to help those people dealing with the monitoring of aquatic ecosystems. Uh, all Tweck's sort of core focus is around aquatic research, as well as the, um, you know, field data collection services that they provide. They've got some really specialised equipment like boats with electrofishing gear on them and that sort of thing, which Murray's going to go through. Uh, so they're a bit like a hydroterra, but based in... Uh, Canada and their core focus has been around this aquatic ecosystem monitoring. So HydroTerra is excited to be levering off their expertise. Um, we've agreed to work with uh, Hall Tech here in Australia as their exclusive distributor, um, both to assist with sales, but also to offer integrated services to support uh, yourselves with those aquatic um, studies. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Murray to uh, present. Thanks very much, Murray. Well, yes, thanks, Richard. Um, and welcome, everyone, and good morning to all our friends uh, down under. It's 5.30 uh, p.m. here on Thursday evening. You're, you've got a full day of work ahead of you, uh, ahead of us. So. Um, uh, I just uh, really excited to present some of our 
our tools and technology and, and see how it could possibly be a fit for some of your organizations in Australia. So uh, I have been asked to uh, maybe present uh, on the basis and on the assumption that maybe uh, these types of tools would be new to most of you. So we'll, um, uh, if you do have experience in electrofishing or environmental DNA or are uh, skilled at uh, limnological sampling and you have some higher level questions, um, please um, post those on the Q&A on your page. And then Michelle, our coordinator, will be um, presenting those, or I think Richard will be reading them at the end of the presentation. So for, um, for most of you, um, well, electrofishing has been around for uh, 50 years or so. It was very, very crude in the, in the, in the beginning, probably as crude as uh, hooking a couple of jumper cables on a, a car battery, throwing them in the water and see what floated away. Um, very dangerous. Uh, and then they started just plugging, throwing uh, cables in from AC generators and uh, just walking around without gloves or waders and uh, just um, highly lethal and extremely dangerous. So We've come a long way since those times. Our backpack electrofishing systems and boat electrofishing systems have uh, many, many safety and safeguards involved like tilt sensors and immersion sensors, overload sensors, shutdowns, um, and the, the whole basis of the technology, uh, its safety is paramount. So on top of the safety features included, actually, I'm sorry, that, that picture you're looking at right there is actually our Osmos environment. And in, in Canada, North America, uh, you cannot operate a backpack electrofisher or be on a boat electrofishing team unless you have certification and that usually involves a day of theory in class theory and then um, one or two days of practical uh, training in the field with a certified instructor. Um, also, in order to go to the field and actually collect uh, fish, you have to apply for and receive a a uh, scientific collector's permit issued by the Ministry of Natural Resources in Ontario are, um, and then across North America, they'd have similar um, authoritative bodies that regulate that. You just can't go out and, and sample in, and take fish from the system uh, without, uh, without telling people where or what you're be and Uh, it's interesting, dovetails because or the amount of debris, water, or any number of uh, factors you may not actually um, roll fish and collect them. You can appreciate in a highly turbid system, you could actually be rolling fish, but what we're doing, we're uh, creating um, an electrical field in, in the water, uh, which creates a taxis or a muscle spasm in the fish and their swim bladder floats them to the surface. And then there's usually two netters on either side of the, the operator and they, um, they scoop, there's a good picture there. Uh, they're actually picking up the fish and putting them in a pail and they'll do time transects or uh, uh, 40 meter transects. There's any number of different protocol and then they'll process all the fish at the end of that. So in that particular, uh, there'd be no problem seeing the fish in those clear uh, pristine streams. 
And that's where electrofishing is highly effective. However, if you are working in highly turbid systems, you could be rolling fish and you couldn't be collecting them. So environmental DNA uh, will allow you to pick up traces of shedded DNA uh, from their systems, uh, from their, their, their tissue, from their gametes, from their, their excrement and any, any Greek regurgitation. So all of these excretions from aquatic organisms contain DNA. And if you sample in the proper target area and at the proper depth where you know that species would be, uh, then you can extract that eDNA sample off of the membrane and run it through a qPCR or thermal cycler to extract that and check it against an assay that you have. So it's not the type of eDNA, it's not the type of technology where you could go and take a sample and it will tell you all of the biota that's in that system. You have to be looking for something specific. So that's why uh, it's of enormous use when looking, let's say, in part of a, in, uh, an environment assessment, uh, environmental assessment that's involved before any development is done, before any road crossing or road is built or a bridge, uh, crossing of a wetland or a perimeter. Um, and there are threatened or endangered species in these habitats um, the detection of a threatened or endangered species will definitely halt that development. And then uh, either it's halted permanently or there'll be um, some form of compensation. They'll move, they'll try to relocate the animals or they'll, that's when it starts to get quite uh, interesting in terms of preserving these, these species here for future generations and and not just running haphazard and uh, destroying all the habitat what we have done uh, typically in our past. So tremendous tools for um, uh, understanding what's in the environment before we make catastrophic changes to those, uh, those systems. So um, what you're seeing there is our backpack electrofishing system. And what we thought we'd do, this is just one of our uh, uh, good colleagues and customers down in New York State in the United States. Uh, that's Mark, uh, Professor Mark Cromwell, and he's just gonna give a brief little video here. They've been longtime customers and using our uh, HT2000 backpack electrofisher in their, um, in their, uh, their class studies. So maybe Michelle, you could run that video, please. I'm Professor Mark Cornwell, and I teach fisheries classes here at SUNY Cobleskill. Here we see a typical fisheries lab at SUNY Cobleskill. In order to collect important fish data, such as size, community composition, health, and survival, fish must first be captured, and this is an electrofishing lab. Electrofishing is a fish capture technique often used by biologists around the world because of its efficiency and mortality rate. The most important thing we have to remember in an electrofishing lab is safety. Modern fisheries units, such as this Haltech backpack shocker, have multiple safety mechanisms to ensure operator and netman safety. Waterproof waders and lineman's gloves are worn by all to ensure insulation from the electric field. Electrofishing works because freshwater fish have a higher salinity than the fresh water they swim in. So the fish is actually more conductive than the water and is the path of least resistance for the electricity. Even though the electric shock is powerful, it won't harm the fish as long as they are not subjected to the electricity for a long time. Once fish are stunned, they're easily netted up and placed in a bucket until the sample is complete. Fish collection continues until the target number of fish are acquired or a designated area has been thoroughly fished. Once the fish are processed, which includes weighing and measuring them, they are returned to the water unharmed. Brook trout, such as the ones that you see here, are very sensitive species, and they're indicators of excellent water quality. And by having up-to-date fish data, resource managers, such as the New York State DEC, are able to make good decisions that will benefit not only the fish, but also the aquatic environment and the people who rely on it.
Very good. So that is a, a perfect example of how the technology can be used. Um, and it's widely used by educational institutions as well as um, any science authority or monitoring department uh, federally or provincially or uh, statewide. Um, and I know we've, we've had, uh, um, I believe in uh, the Department of Environmental Sustainability, we've had some backpack systems there. Um, and, but we're looking to uh, break into the Australian market and make a, a much higher impact with our relationship with uh, Hydroterra. So the, as I, I talked earlier on explaining the advantages of, uh, uh, of electrofishing, eDNA, although it has been around in much cruder forms for many, many, uh, like probably uh, two decades or more, uh, but the, 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 the ways and means of collecting the sample was quite crude. So you might be using a, a hand peristolic or a hand pump or a peristolic pump, or even just uh, scooping up water and pulling it through a membrane. Um, but without a lot of thought of uh, the contamination of the sample, and this is paramount in uh, environmental DNA sampling is using proper sterilizing techniques so you do not contaminate the sample um, and throw your, um, and, and skew your, your, um, your results. So uh, sterilizing your, uh, the device in our, in our case, our aluminum re reusable uh, uh, sample housing, there is a one or five or micron membrane contained in that. And basically what we're doing uh, with our system is uh, drawing water up through the nozzle and, and monitoring our pressure and flow so that as the membrane does start to clog with some suspended matter in the water that we can slow the pump down and still meet our target volume. Let's say if we're sampling for one or two liters, um, if the water becomes, uh, if it is turbid, you're gonna get uh, sediment collecting on the membrane. If the pump is, is too high a pressure, you're gonna destroy that membrane and you'll have to start over again. So it's very important to slow the pump down and make sure you get your target volume because uh, the sampling technique would require um, a several replicates because they're, they're testing uh, against each other in a lab. Um, and you could, um, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's laborious and there's a lot of logistics to getting into remote areas. So you have to maintain and, and make sure that you, you don't destroy your samples before you actually collect them. So in the field, they, uh, the sample membrane would be uh, removed from the housing and put in a lysis buffer. And that eDNA is extracted through uh, a number of uh, manufacturers around the world, uh, make portable or uh, systems that you could use in the field. Uh, but traditionally in the past, uh, these samples would have been taken back to a, a properly accredited lab with proper negative uh, pressure and, and strict protocols in their sterilization to make sure that no foreign uh, DNA is infecting your sample. So there's a lot that goes on behind, far more goes on behind the collection of the sample than actually um, is during the collection of the sample. So our system, uh, as you can see there, we've got a, a tripod and it's designed so that we can use hands-free operation. We can extend a 12 foot pole, uh, just put the end of the nozzle into the system that we're sampling and then start, set our target volume, turn it on and just, uh, just wait until the system does its job. It beeps, you invert the nozzle, the calculations are, our, uh, our flow meter is calculating how much water is still left in that pole so that everything, we know that within 5% of our target volume, that is what's gone, that's the water that's passed through the membrane. 
So I think we have a little video um, showing uh, how it works and uh, we've got a little bit of background music, but I think Michelle's going to turn that down and I can just sort of talk a little bit over that. Thanks, Michelle. So uh, our unit is called the Osmos. And uh, this, these are some, um, a very brief video here that shows the simplicity of the system. So it's designed, we're running off our 29 volt lithium ion power packs, which are very light. They only weigh three pounds. So it's uh, highly effective for getting into remote areas. So in this, uh, this is a stream system here. So you get to a place where you could set up the tripod um, and within 12 feet of uh, your sampling area, you have to know what you're sampling for. So you, you know um, that your target species you're going after is going to be in that habitat. So you have to understand uh, the, um, the, uh, the habitat of uh, the organism you're sampling. So we connect our, our inlet tubes and our outlet tubes we turn on the system and uh, on this system, we have a special bracket and we hang it on the bracket. So that count that acts as the counterweight. So depending on the steepness of the bank, um, even though we're pushing in the, uh, the feet of the tripod, we want to make sure that uh, when you have that pole fully extended to 12 feet that the tri tripod isn't tipping over. So that's why we anchor it with the backpack. So you're you're putting your you're sterilizing all of your your aluminum holders and you're loading them with your filter housing back in your lab, and so you're going into the field with bags full of these as many samples as you're going to do um, in a day's field work. Uh, simply extend the pole. The hose is running down through the middle of the pole. You slowly slow it down and submerge the uh, anterior end of the pole. And then with our, our pivot bracket, we can lock it in place. So at this point, we can go hands-free. We have a remote switch on the front. And there, if you've already, uh, we've there's a target volume of uh, one liter. There's the uh, pump is at 16 kilopascals. We've got 15 feet of, of a hose out and, um, and then we start. So now it's starting the pump and um, we're just waiting while this ramps up. It's showing you real time results. Uh, you can tell by uh, if the pump does slow down, uh, you know it's probably clogging. So at this point you enter it out. So all the water in the pool does come down and is uh, we make sure that it's gone through uh, the membrane and it's cycled through the, the, uh, the pump. At this point, you would uh, retract the pole. And these are all locking knuckles. So uh, they're, they're very uh, robust. Uh, it's a carbon graphite pole, very reliable. And then um, remove the sample, uh, remove that. So it contained inside and there's the membrane con contained inside. So using Sterilize force nips. You uh, delicately remove the uh, the membrane, and then you would have a uh, which is not shown here. You would have a little vial, a lys lysis buffer, and put it in that. So you can collect these, and uh, a lot of people do in field um, extraction so that uh, they're, they are minimizing their, uh, the, the possibility of contaminating the sample. So they're, they're doing that in the field, but if you cannot do it in the field, you can um, carefully transport those on ice or, or uh, dry ice back to a lab and do your extractions there. Basically just tying up the hoses throwing on the backpack and collecting your tripod and pole and onto your next site. So that would take all of, uh, that's probably real time. So in five minutes you can collect, but you would never just take one sample. You would take uh, two or three 
um, samples at each site before moving on. So that's a brief introduction to the Osmos eDNA sampler. Thank you. Oh, Bob McLean, he's a local musician here in Guelph and a good friend. So thanks, Bob, for the music. So um, in 2018, uh, we worked with the uh, University of Guelph and the Biodiversity Institute, which are world renowned for their Barcode of Life project and uh, uh, grad students working in the, uh, the Robert Hanna lab, Hanner lab here, um, and a joint project with Trout Unlimited, their worldwide organization uh, focused on the uh, conservation and preservation of trout species around the world. So what uh, the point of it was, uh, we were, uh, it was a combined effort to just confirm the, the presence of, uh, of uh, brook trout in, um, in the case of Guelph, um, a beautiful urban stream that actually runs through the south uh, era, an urban area of Guelph, but a uh, beautiful cold water stream running through some undeveloped forest in the south end of the city, as well as uh, a site uh, in Niagara Peninsula uh, down near Niagara Falls, the world famous Niagara Falls. So the, um, they're interested in validating um, the eDNA sampling techniques and confirming the, the, uh, the, the, the presence of the species also in confirming that with actually detection and collection using electrofishing equipment. So we, uh, we, we went to the field and sampled, uh, this is the site in Guelph on Hanlon Creek. So, um, um, we went to the field and so that we were not disturbing uh, the sites because electrofishing is quite intrusive. So you actually have to get into the, into the water and you typically work upstream, but that would uh, disturb the, uh, the, the substrates significantly. So um, the, this, the eDNA sampling was done prior to that at all of these sites, five sites along uh, this uh, stretch of creek. And then after uh, that was done, then the um, uh, then those sites were electrofisher uh, um, using our HT2000 electrofisher. And then the report basically goes into uh, detail of um, uh, of the extraction and the sampling results of both techniques. And, and if anyone is interested uh, with that, I have forwarded a, a draft copy of that. It hasn't been finalized yet uh, with, um, uh, unfortunately with COVID, a lot of these uh, university labs are, are shut down and very hard to get access to. And, and we're just coming into um, uh, a possible another shutdown here locally. So this isn't going to change in the short term. But uh, so, but the draft report is available and I have uh, I have permission to share that with uh, you through uh, from the university and Trout Unlimited to, uh, if you're interested. So just uh, let uh, Richard and Michelle know. So um, one thing to note here on our Osmos nozzle. So you'll see three stages there. Uh, there's one stage that's missing. So on the right-hand side, we have the upper. So that's connected to uh, the pole. And then um, uh, the middle stage there, you don't have, if you're sampling in very pristine environments and non-turbid environments, that's actually a pre-filter. So we can have the, the, um, the inlet stage on the left connect right to the uh, the final stage on the right and eliminate that stage in the middle. But in some areas that are highly turbid, if we don't um, have a pre-filter taking some of the sediment, so it would be a coarser micron, if we're collecting, if our eDNA sample membrane is one or five micron, then you may be putting a, a 10 or 20 or 100 micron filter in the pre-filter just to allow uh, to stop the sediment from clogging the nozzle, but still coarse enough to allow the eDNA, their, their, uh, 
microscopic and um, they can still pass through that pre-filter and still get captured on the final membrane. So that's why we do that. And we also do use uh, uh, precision machining of aluminum so that these can be used time and time and time again. Um, so we don't have reoccurring costs. We're not filling uh, landfills up with single use plastic um, nozzles. Um, so we're conscious of that. So uh, the next day or the next slide, Michelle, I think, um, if you could advance that. Okay, so we're just, this is the other sampling site down at uh, uh, Niagara. Basically, this was quite different in that we have two uh, reaches of this system. Um, so it was interesting to see they weren't spatially connected. So um, completely different communities of, uh, of brook trout and uh, they, uh, we, we did have detections at, at both. And it was interesting to see that in all of the sites, the Osmos uh, eDNA detector did con um, confirm the presence or uh, aligned with our, um, the electrofishing detections as well. So a lot of people are, they often think whether eDNA could be used as uh, an indicator of abundance of a species. And uh, to date that's, that's uh, still being discussed. The, the, this particular report does not see a co um, correlation between um, presence of, of eDNA and abundance. So some site, for example, some sites we collected maybe 10 brook trout, but the eDNA uh, signature wasn't significantly higher than in sites that we collected two brook trouts. But eDNA is interesting in that you don't know exactly where the, that, um, DNA is coming from. It could be coming from upstream in the system. So these are the things that um, um, are still being explored in the science and, and the, the people are using this all over the world and extremely bright people, uh, so vastly more qualified than I am to, to talk to this, but uh, uh, it's their, um, um, I would defer to Dr. Bob Hanner at the University of Guelph for some of his publications and, and uh, his, his many associates. So if you're interested in delving into this further, again, uh, contact us through uh, Richard at uh, Hydroterra and, and we can help you make some connections and um, help you understand how this could be uh, beneficial to some of your uh, your research. So we are interested after, after this, and perhaps it can be discussed in the Q&A, do, uh, do you see some of this technology of being of use in what you're doing? And um, if, if not right now, uh, certainly in the future, do you see where this is going? So yeah, these are the, some of the conclusions here that uh, uh, the Brook Trout work uh, were identified at both sites and the use of environmental DNA monitoring validated with electrofishing. So um, if, um, yeah, it, uh, it's gonna be interesting to know. So in perhaps in, uh, in South Australia, um, yeah, I guess you can, uh, you can do, we're polling you right now and, our, and Michelle is, uh, can share the results of the poll. I have no idea how many people are actually uh, Joining in this, uh, joining us on this webinar, I hope I'm not just talking to myself, and uh, it'd be interesting to see some of the responses to some of these. Um, so, if uh, uh, maybe at this point, uh, I don't know where we are in the time schedule, uh, Michelle. If you want to um, tell us where we're at. It's it's uh, it's ten oh five a.m. Murray. So you've got 
a bit more time if you like, or you can hand back to yeah. myself uh, for questions. Well, I um, actually, let's just talk a little bit more about uh, some of the products that Halt can offer. So on top of um, our um, electric fishing, so backpack electric fishing, boat electric fishing equipment, also the backpacks, we have conversion kits that can be used for electroanesthesia and narcosis. So if you want to sample fish in your in your um, your for your in your lab studies or your hatcheries, then we can sedate this fish so that you can actually handle them. Maybe to uh, install some pit tags or do some fin clipping or extract some roe, so you can safely handle the fish and then they re gently recover from the uh, from the sedation and then you can return them back into your your hatchery or uh, back into the stream. So typically, uh, before electro sedation came along, uh, people were using clove oil. So clove oil sedates the fish, but you cannot return the fish. It takes them um, a couple of days actually to recover from that. Um, if you uh, release them to a, a stream before they were fully recovered, they could be subject to predation. Uh, they wouldn't have all their wits about them to. Uh, to escape uh, high order predators. So uh, the nice thing about electrofishing, once they recover from, um, from the uh, taxes, then they're completely uh, uh, ready to re be returned to the stream. So we also have conversion kits to use in uh, small John boats for streams that are uh, slightly deeper, uh, where you could, they're not weightable with your waders or tote barges where you can, uh, you can put the equipment in a tote barge and still walk around. And then right up to very powerful boat systems where uh, you know, we're putting up to 12,000 volts in the water and um, sampling species at depth in large uh, water bodies. On top of that, we, uh, we manufacture a complete line of limnological equipment. So, uh, from sampling benthic organisms and uh, like uh, nets, plankton nets, uh, kick nets, uh, uh, Ekman dredges, ponar type dredges, Van Dorn bottles, uh, Kemmerer bottles. Uh, we make custom apparatus. Uh, some of our, our uh, most fun project is when scientists come to us and ask, this is, this is a project, this is what I need to do nothing exists, can you build this for us? We love projects like this and we do projects like that and um, uh, prototypes like that for projects all over the world. So if you have research and something does not exist to do what you want to do, uh, that is, uh, that's one of our, our fortes. Um, custom application, yeah. So we can make anything and um, uh, we're looking forward to, to working with you all. So maybe at this point, um, um, if Richard wants to delve into maybe start the Q and A's, if you have any, or maybe we have some Q and A's ready now. Sure, Murray. Thanks. Uh, firstly, thanks very much for that presentation. Very interesting. I think um, judging by the, the feedback from the audience, uh, you're educating us all. <laughs> um, and I think that's that's an important thing to be aware of. So a lot of our customers at Hydroterra deal a lot with things like ecological risk assessments and with uh, environmental monitoring, but often those uh, studies are based more on things like water quality and that sort of thing with less of a focus on the actual ecology that's uh, really what it's all about, right? Protecting the environment. So I think it's great to get a perspective on how we can monitor the actual flora and fauna of the world and, you know, hopefully use trend analysis to see uh, if we are making a real impact from all those efforts. Um, so I do have quite a few questions for you, Murray, actually. Um, one of which you, you did answer, which was um, 
around whether or not we can use eDNA to quantify, you know, the recovery of the quantity of uh, fish in a particular river system. But um, maybe if you could just share a bit there in terms of how how uh, people uh, in Canada have have looked at monitoring the success of, say, restoration of the lakes and river systems using eDNA. You know, what's the frequency of monitoring that they've actually used for the eDNA uh, side of things? Well, it's uh, um, again, it's a it's a new science, really. Uh, it although it's been around for a while, it's been it's been crude. So. Uh, where we're seeing it now, and it's it, it has to be accepted, and we're just getting um, accepted by the regulatory bodies as, as an accepted sampling tool. Uh, and this has been through the enormous efforts of um, um, uh, a lot of university um, and uh, private consultants um, that have proven that um, through their efforts that you can actually detect the presence of a species without actually collecting it. And where it's very interesting is that, and here's, here's a perfect example of um, a success story where a large development was uh, slated to, uh, um, on, a, on a large piece of property, uh, you know, let's say a hundred acres and uh, previous conservation or uh, conservation authorities and had uh, had seen and identified this area as a um, as habitat for uh, an endangered species of turtle here called the Blandings turtle. Um, although no one had seen like monitoring efforts going out uh, at times when they had seen them in the past, hadn't detected them for, I think, two or three years. And the developers were rubbing their hands together, thinking that the, the only obstacle between them and, and building this, uh, this large uh, uh, residential block was, uh, was disappearing because there were no visual detections uh, over um, some time until um, uh, a group went in and ex with um, uh, DNA sampling. So they were sampling the, 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 the problem with reptiles is that they are habit their habitats are verner pools or shallow areas that uh, may dry up later on in the year and they move on and they're constantly on the move and or in turtles they're burying themselves in the mud and uh, it's a tremendous effort to actually see them but sampling of uh, vernal pools in this area detected positive positive uh, detection of blending's dna at the site so they said uh, they went back with a much greater um, visual effort and actually did find uh, the animals present. So, and uh, there's a number of stories uh, that, that rings true. Jefferson Salamander, again, uh, you know, virtually uh, impossible to find or very difficult to find, but by sampling their habitat, we know they're there. And uh, this is now being um, accepted as a science verified sampling technique and tool. And uh, it's, it's all focusing around the methodology. So uh, the, the methods used to do it have to be, have to be certified you have to follow us a protocol. And if that is done and that's proven, then that science is accepted by the regulators. So that's where we are at in, in North America. 
and and Europe too. Actually, uh, Europe is quite advanced on on um, on their eDNA research. So we're very excited. It's a it's a it's another tool in our toolbox and going forward and it's far less intrusive than some of our other sampling techniques and we see it as a massive growth area and uh, it's going to be an outstanding opportunity for um, companies that are delving into this space and uh, and um, and and need to find these these animals and just can't detect them in any other manner. I think um, in Australia, one of the hot topics at the moment is around groundwater, surface water interaction and the potential impacts of um, the contaminated groundwater discharges to freshwater ecosystems. And we had recently had a workshop um, on that that was um, run by the Australian Land and Groundwater Association. One thing that's of uh, interest uh, to myself is the ability to use um, these devices to screen across areas of sort of known groundwater discharge to try and compare the uh, ecological health of those discharge zones versus uh, uh, those areas that are considered not to be impacted by the discharge of groundwater. So I think uh, this eDNA approach uh, might, might provide part of the answer in terms of trying to characterise the differences. But I suppose the question is, um, you know, how far does DNA drift and how long does DNA last? Um, mm -hmm. Like you mentioned that turtle study, um, you know, is it possible that it's uh, a lot of the time it's residue from a turtle that might have died five years earlier? Uh, do, do you have any? Uh, Actually, that's, that's, yeah, that's an excellent question. So definitely uh, in a flowing system, so you're going to, the DNA will flush out through the system um, and definitely uh, through the decay of an animal, there's massive amounts of uh, uh, DNA um, uh, left in the residue or left in the, in the substrate. So uh, absolutely that, that could be um, a possibility. So I, uh, to my knowledge, they, I'm not sure if they can detect if the, so this is the, um, this is a question for the scientist. Can they determine whether the DNA collected is historical DNA or if it's actually from an organism that's recently passed through uh, the sample site? So um, absolutely, those are, those are things that um, um, you can't tell you can't tell when the uh, the the organism has been there, but the technology is a, is improving, and I could see that being something that uh, could change in the future. Um, probably last question for you, Murray. Just um, around electro fishing. Um, I know uh, the science has improved a lot. Um, as you mentioned, started off with car batteries and things, and then, then uh, since then progressed in levels of sophistication. Um, so it was interesting to see you, you've worked out a sort of voltage that stuns fish, but but brings them back to uh, to life. I was just wondering about some of our other uh, m mammals and things that live in in the water too. Um, like in particular in Australia, the platypus, for example, is a is a very uh, shy and uh, creature. But how vulnerable are the mammals to uh, being um, zapped, if you like, versus the fish species? Has there been uh, uh, studies done to work out if if they're more sensitive or less sensitive, for example, than the fish themselves? 
Yeah, so the, the larger the organism, whether it's a fish or a mammal or an invertebrate, invertebrate, the largest surface area they have to absorb the electricity. So um, like a large fish will feel a higher voltage gradient than a smaller fish. Smaller fish are much harder to, to, to shock. So most definitely, um, the platypus would not be happy about being in the electrical field and um, you'll probably get him uh, uh, exiting the area very quickly. Um, I'm not sure whether a mammal would actually go into taxis, become immobilized. I think they would probably feel the shock and uh, they would exit uh, very, very quickly. <laughs> but yeah, and I and I would be I would be concerned about that. So if I knew that there were platypus and they're an endangered species, then I would be quite concerned about using electrofishing to, uh, technology in that environment. I would I would put very 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 low voltage, and um, and maybe encourage them to leave before we actually turned it up so we could achieve taxes in the fish. Uh, I did have one more question, sorry. And then uh, then we'd probably let you have a rest. But the you, you mentioned that the, the reason it works well is that there's a difference in uh, how the electric current moves through the fresh water versus the fish themselves. Right. And just wondering in, as we get into more of our estuarine systems and quite a few of Australia's uh, streams are actually, you know, they have some saline groundwater discharges and that sort of thing. We don't have as many beautiful freshwater streams as Canada, that's for sure. What, what are the repercussions for electrofishing of increased salinity in the water? Yeah, so that's a, that's a game changer. So. Uh, as you increase salinity, then the the environment is more conductive than the fish species. So electricity always takes the path of least resistance. So unless you have massive power, so we our primary power supply would be a generator and then through our pulse boxes. So it's um, uh, depending on the conductivity of these brackish systems, um, you are... Um, you may not be able to achieve any um, results at all. Just the electricity is going through the water rather than the fish. So um, the first thing you would do is um, do your conductivity. And if we are in a situation that's, you know, 6,000 microsiemens, 7,000 microsiemens per centimeter, then you're probably not going to be very effective with electrofishing. So in these environments, then you have to go back to traditional net netting, uh, trap nets and gill nets. Okay, so uh, it's been a very interesting presentation, Murray. Do you think uh, just in summary that the, the future of characterizing the, the health of um, these sort of aquatic ecosystems is going to be more of a staged approach where you might start with eDNA as a sort of standard and then um, once you know what species are there, um, set up and almost um, customise your sampling with the electrofishing after that? So no, it would probably be the other way around. So remember eDNA, you can't take a sample of a water and it and then extract it and identify all of the species there. It's, it's not a tool for identifying species abundance and uh, diversity. All eDNA can do is tell you whether you have to have a sample of eDNA of a target species that you're looking for, and then the sampling technique will tell you whether that species is present or ab absent from that environment. Um, electrofishing, on the other hand, is uh, that's why it's been so popular and effective for decades in that it is the only way 
the most effective way without exception to go in and do a complete biodiversity study. You can look, you're going to capture every single organism in that system, all of the species of fish, um, invertebrates, crayfish, um, and um, that's how we're going to, that's how we do our classification. So you're looking, your species identification and, and density and diversity, that's where electrofishing uh, works far better than anything. In the past, we used nets, sane nets, with highly uh, uh, damaging when not done properly. There was high mortalities, but when electrofishing is done properly, we have uh, virtually no mortality. And you just return the fish happily to the stream after you've collected them. You can do all your biometrics, you do your weights, your lengths, your IDs, you can look at fish health, you can handle them. Like there's things you can do with uh, electrofishing that you can't do any other way. So any, any, any study where you actually have to see what's there, electrofishing is the way to do it. Okay, so that was interesting. It wasn't actually the answer I was expecting, Murray. So that you're uh, <laughs> con Sorry. continuing to educate me. Uh, yeah. But um, look, I think we'll wind it up there. Um, what, I, what I'm uh, very interested in is uh, as Hydroterra is moving more and more into this area of monitoring natural resources is probably to set up a forum for sort of best practice characterization of natural systems and we'll be looking to do that in the new year but uh, certainly what you've described today is uh, two technologies that uh, sound pretty critical in terms of helping us to get a better handle on uh, the health of ecosystems. It sounds like electrofishing might be a bit challenging in some of our estuarine environments, um, but certainly great to know of it as an effective tool in those freshwater systems where the EC is sort of below 6,000. So many thanks for your time. It's been, uh, it's been very informative and um, look forward to uh, hearing more from you in the new year. Well, it's been wonderful uh, speaking with you all and I'm uh, looking forward to continued conversations and uh, just want to wish everyone there um, uh, safe and, and health during this pandemic and, um, and still hope we can all have a wonderful Christmas holiday and uh, maybe get our mind off some of this uh, that's going on in the world today and get our minds back in the new year to, to protecting our, our environments and preserving, um, preserving our, uh, the world for our future generations. So thank you very much once again and Merry Christmas, everybody. Thanks, Murray. Okay, bye-bye for now. Bye.